Good morning. Welcome to Discovery's Digital Gathering. We are glad you're here. We are excited for what God has in store this morning. We want to invite you to download our app, which will help you stay current with our community and get further connected by filling out our new visitor card. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and for the adventure of discovering the good news of Jesus together. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Discovery. So glad to have you join us this morning and excited to worship together. With that, we're going to pass it over to James and the team. Good morning, Discovery. Let's worship today. The whole earth is filled. The whole earth is filled. It's filled with your glory. It's filled with your glory my whole life. Way I 
find the truth in the light. All right, everyone, so just a few quick announcements for us all. Um, the usual announcement, if this is your first time checking out Discovery, we are so glad to have you here. Definitely, you know, uh, check out the app, um, the Discovery Christian Church app. There's a way to connect there. We would love to um, just be able to connect with you and help you plug into the community here. Also, just a few quick announcements. So Operation Backpack is something we do every year, um, partnering with Margaret Montgomery. Uh, one of the local schools here and really it's just about providing backpacks um, filled with back to school needs for um, some of the kids in need and to be able to help bless them and the community in that way. So um, you can either email the staff team here um, and find a time to schedule to drop off at the downtown center or next week which would be August 15th if you're coming to kind of church outdoors you can bring the backpacks there and some of the things that people are looking for it's um, you know new backpacks number two pencils pencil case spiral notebook pocket folder ruler glue sticks crayons you know all that good back to school stuff that sometimes we take so for granted but for a kid to not have that and try to go to school is so difficult and so really having a brand new backpack with these brand new things can be such a huge blessing to just help them along their way in their academics um, so again you can drop it off um, on Sunday uh, 815 or email info at discoverydavis.org to kind of set up a time to do that. Uh, next announcement. So men's retreat is something uh, that we do every year, except for when there's a crazy heart of the pandemic. <laughs> so we didn't have one last year, but very excited to be able to do it this year. It's going to be August 27th to August 29th at um, Camp High, Sierra Cabins. We will not be in tents this year, so we will be in cabins. Definitely a step up for us men. Um, I'm really excited for that time there. Um, the topic is going to be on genuine friendships and genuine relationships and looking forward to being able to spend that time together. So that's August 27th to 29th. Um, you can talk to Reed there uh, for signups. And then lastly, just giving. You know, at Discovery, we aim to give worshipfully, sacrificially, and missionally. Um, I think everything that we do here is ultimately run by the community in order to um, just give back to God a little bit of what he's given and use those resources to really be able to bless the community here and help people come to know Jesus. Um, so we encourage you to continue to just pray through that and continue to partner with us. You can either give through the app, you can send a check to the downtown center. Um, so again, thank you for that. And um, let me pray for the offerings real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for, um, again, your abundant generosity towards us, Lord. Um, everything we have is from you. And Lord, as we you know, consider of our giving of our time, of our resources, Lord, we, it's just a small token of, of gratitude to you, Lord. But we pray that you would give us as a church just wisdom in knowing how to use it and apply it to really farther um, your name, your kingdom, and your love, God. Um, there's just so many needs in this community, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to meet those needs as the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to um, be a part of what you're doing, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, good morning, Discovery. It's great to be here again with you all. Um, my name is Yuan, one of the elders here, and as you guys know, Steve and his family have been off on a well-deserved vacation for the last several weeks, and they are back uh, in action, but we figured we wouldn't throw him right into preaching uh, duty right away. So um, I get the privilege of kind of sharing the word with you all this morning. So if you know me, I am definitely a big picture kind of guy. So before we dive in, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. So you can start turning there uh, in your physical Bible, on the app, on the interweb, whatever your choice for the Bible is there. Um, but I want to zoom out a little bit and just take a look at the macro level, right? Why are we even talking about the book of Acts? And what are we hoping to get out of this sermon series? So really, I think the book of Acts fits right into who we want to be as a church. So if you've been on our website or you've been around Discovery, you know that our mission as a church is right in our namesake, Discovery, right? It's to help people discover the good news of Jesus. And more specifically, we want to do this in fresh new ways that are going to help build bridges across some of the societal, cultural, and even religious barriers that so often keep people from encountering Jesus, right? If you look at you know, the church today in America and you hear the words church, or you hear the words Christian, so often in our society, those words have some really negative connotations. And yet at the same time, you hear the word Jesus and most people are like, yeah, Jesus was a pretty awesome guy and I would love to get to know him more. Right? And so it raises the question for us today, has some of our church culture and the things that we do in the church become a stumbling block and gotten in the way of people actually getting to know Jesus? And what does it mean for us as a community of Jesus followers to be able to actually bring and share and be good news to our community right here in Davis? 
Right? And that idea right there is so central to what the book of Acts is about. Right? Because in Acts, this was the early church community. The resurrection of Jesus has just happened, and it was a community of Jesus followers trying to figure out what it means and looks like to live as a community of Jesus followers, but also then to follow him and his spirits moving as they then share the good news of Jesus and help different cultures, different regions, and people of all sorts come to know the good news of Jesus. Right? And as we've already seen through the first eight chapters of Acts, there's been some tremendous transformation happening everywhere the good news of Jesus goes. And that's what we want to continue to see and glean from um, for us here as we enter Acts chapter 9. So with that said, where are we as we enter chapter 9? Um, well, Luke, the author of Acts in chapter 1, verse 8, kind of gives us the roadmap, right? That, you know, um, Jesus' disciples are going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and, Sam and Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth, right? And so in Acts chapter 9, we are in the Judea and Samaria part of it. And this is actually one of the pivotal chapters that's going to start getting us set up for the ends of the earth, which uh, in Acts ultimately lands in Rome, right? Um, so let's go ahead and dive into Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 together. Um, before we do that, let me just kind of pray for us real quick, and then we'll dive in together. Um, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this morning. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to get to dive into your word, Lord. Uh, we thank you for um, just who you are, for your death, for your resurrection, um, for the life that you've invited us into. Um, and Lord Jesus, you are good news indeed. God, we pray that in the things that are shared this morning, um, we would see you as good news um, in fresh new ways and just be excited about um, who you are, what you're doing, and what you've uh, so graciously invited us to be a part of, Lord. And give this morning up to you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I'm just going to read two verses. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. All right, now let's pause there. All right. We're picking up in Acts chapter 9. This is like just beautiful storytelling, right? We're in a different part of the story in Acts chapter 8, and you get this like flip over to, meanwhile, here's what's going on with Saul, right? And if you remember back last time we saw Saul was at the end of uh, Acts chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. And what was going on there, right? Stephen, uh, one of the uh, first deacons, had just preached a, gospel, uh, a sermon, and he was stoned to death, right? And while he was being stoned to death, Saul was there, nodding in approval, and people were laying their coats down at Saul's feet, right? Like Saul was the man in charge. And in the beginning of chapter 8, Saul was going and dragging people who were following Jesus out of the synagogues and throwing them in prison, right? That was the last time we saw Saul. And here in Acts chapter 9, he's picking up right where he left off. And so if you just think about this from a storytelling standpoint for a second, like Saul, Paul, I'm going to use his names interchangeably here. So if I say Paul, I mean Saul. If I say Saul, I mean Paul. Um, he is like the big bad guy in this story, right? Like in a Star Wars universe, he would be like the Darth Vader character getting set up, right? He's the big bad guy chasing people down zealously, right? Nobody's telling him to do this. He is taking initiative to say, hey, give me permission to go drag these people out and throw them in prison. And so you can imagine how the church feels about him and, you know, just his story. And that's the first thing I want to see, right? Don't miss the storytelling piece of this, of just the character of Saul and how much of a threat he would have been to the church at this time. The second thing I want us to see here in these first two verses is the fact that he's persecuting the way, right? And I love that statement because so often when we think about the church and Christianity, we're like, oh, like, you know, what is Christianity? Is it just a set of doctrines or like a list of do's and don'ts? And I mean, they weren't even called Christians until Acts chapter 11, okay? So all the way, Acts chapters 1 through 11, they're just following the way. And this word, the way, is literally translated the road, the path, the journey. And I love that word, the journey. It's one that we talk about a lot here at Discovery, which is this idea that when you're following Jesus, it's a journey, right? And here in Acts chapter 9, Paul is essentially persecuting those who are on this journey of following Jesus. So as we're diving into the story of Saul, of Paul, the big question for us this morning is what is the way, right? Another Star Wars reference for you guys, if you guys have been watching The Mandalorian at all on Disney+, right? Every moment you get, right, the Man Mando's like, 
this is the way. And you're like, what is the way, right? And he never really tells you. And so the big question for us this morning is, what is the way, right? What is this journey um, that Paul is persecuting? And ultimately, as we're going to see in chapter 9, this way that uh, Saul ends up joining and becoming a part of. Now, to back up real quick, a lot of times when we talk about Saul, we talk about Paul and his conversion, we tend to put him up on a pedestal, right? Because Paul is like, the guy, right? He's like the big missionary guy. He wrote about, you know, about 50% of the books in the New Testament are attributed to Paul. And so, and he wrote some of the kind of deepest um, theses on kind of theology, right? That we get to break down. And so we tend to set him up on a pedestal. But what I want us to see today is to just humanize him a little bit, right? Humanize his story a little bit, because at the end of the day, right, even though half of Acts is about Paul and his missionary journeys, he's not the hero of the story. Right? Jesus is the hero of the story, and what Jesus is doing through the Holy Spirit and through his community is what the book of Acts is all about. And Saul, is as important as he is, is just a part of that story. And so I want us to humanize his experience a little bit. And to help us do that, we're actually going to get two stories and testimonies from our very own Jamel and Mabel. They're going to share their stories first, and then we'll circle back and take a look at Paul's story and what they have in common. Hi everyone, my name is Mabel. I am not Yuan's daughter, but we have the same name. Uh, yeah, Yuan asked me to share my testimony, and so I'm really excited to share Jesus and how God has transformed my life. So just a little bit of a backstory. I didn't grow up going to church. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents believe in a different religion, and I am Chinese, and so there's a lot of culture and traditions that we did growing up that I didn't super understand um, but I just did them because it was a family thing and even when I asked um, I think I just didn't super understand them so I was very curious about religion and I just was a very curious kid so I, all the, I had all these questions and looking back it's so cool because I can see moments where God has been reaching out using different friends in high school my a girl from my soccer team, she invited me to a small group and said, hey, I just wanted to invite you because I think you would really like it. And she was really surprised when I told her like, oh yeah, I'm actually not a Christian, but is it okay to join? So I had this curiosity and my two best friends in high school were also Christians. So I had asked them like, what does John 3.16 mean? I see it sometimes like on the back of in and out or whatever. Um, and so they tried their best to explain it. So coming into college, I was very curious about Christianity, about God, about Jesus, hearing these things, but not really knowing what these things were. So <laughs> my freshman year, I was moving in the dorms and <laughs> someone waved me over and said, do you want a free t-shirt? And I was like, yes, I love free stuff. Give me that free t-shirt, which is such a throwback because Jeff talked about free t-shirts last week. And so that was me. And <laughs> um, this girl, my friend Imani, uh, told me just about like this is what the gospel is um, if you're interested here is like my phone number you can always reach out and so I thought about that but then college was a little bit a lot <laughs> so fall quarter it was just a lot of classes and it was really overwhelming but I had remembered oh, okay there was this really nice girl that said I could reach out if anything happened and so something happened fall quarter and I reached out to her just to say like, hey, I think classes are really overwhelming. Can we just go get coffee or something? And she was so kind and showed me that love of Jesus, um, even though we barely even knew each other. And so Thanksgiving week or so, I, right after that week, I came to a small group <laughs> and learned about Jesus for the first time. And I didn't know what grace was. I didn't know what salvation meant. I barely even knew who Jesus was. I think opening the Bible for the first time was so confusing because it was like, what does Luke like, two, three mean? Why are there two numbers? Like, what does that mean, right? Um, so I had all these questions and I came in almost as like in, an investigator, like a journalist and was like, okay, like let's answer all these questions. And so I started attending Bible study and these group of girls were some of the sweetest and are still some of the sweetest girls that I know and they've become my closest friends. Uh, I joined this Bible study and these girls were very kind and shared about the gospel, they shared about Jesus, and I was really blown away by how kind they were. 
Um, they answered all my questions <laughs> and it was just really great. And so I could see Jesus moving in my life and I could tell that it's not just these people that, it's not just about friendships at this point. I can tell that something inside me is changing and God is the one that's transforming me, but he's using different people in my life. So that was a really cool thing. Um, I was just sitting in my living room one day and I was like, I feel this change inside me. And I knew that it was God. It wasn't people, it wasn't me, it wasn't my own doing. It wasn't because I was doing the right things or saying the right things, but it was because of God. And it's just amazing that we have a God that is so kind and loving and sacrificial that he gave his son Jesus to us. And it's so exciting because you have this amazing gift and like Yuan said, you want to share this. You want to, now that you're transformed as a follower of Christ, you want to share this beautiful gift and you want other people to discover this good news. And so for friends out there that don't know Jesus yet, um, get to know Jesus. You can read the Bible, you can pray, you can ask other people. Um, you can ask me. <laughs> yeah, like Yuan said, being a follower of Christ does not mean everything is rainbows and sunshine. Um, it's still trials, but there is a peace knowing that God, the creator of this universe, is on your side and he is for you. Jesus has already died for your sins, so like, why not? <laughs> you know, like, who else has died for your sins? No one. <laughs> um, and he has resurrected, so what? Like, it feels like a no-brainer at times. Um, but yeah, Jesus' love is really, really sweet. And thank you so much for listening to my story and celebrating that God changes people's lives, like Jamel and I. And from Saul to Paul, have a great day. My name is Jamel. Um, I've been going to Discovery Now for probably four months and um, wanted to share my testimony with everybody. So for me, I actually moved to the Davis area probably about 10 years ago, but I actually grew up in the South, in New Orleans. Not Southern California, but Southern Louisiana. Um, it's a very strong Bible Belt location. So um, Christ was put in my life at the very beginning. Um, it's a city uh, that <laughs> pretty much, uh, the, the term Lord knows you hear quite often in almost every sentence. So being able to kind of be in that environment really gave me a, a very strong understanding of what the image that is supposed to be portrayed of what Christ is, but really didn't understand the substance. And um, as I continue to get older, I, you know, I gave my life to Christ at the age of 13. Um, and then I ended up kind of continuing that relationship in the same way that I, I grew up in that environment. Um, just understanding, kind of like, like, like Paul did, where you understood the rules, but again, still kind of not having that understanding of, of, of Christ in the, in the sense of not just rules, but actually his substance and his purpose. It wasn't until I would really say that um, I really gave my life to Christ um, was when I became older and I went through probably uh, the most, I don't want to say traumatizing, but definitely most memorable shift in my life where, you know, I jokingly say I went from uh, Jamel with little M to Jamel with capital M. Um, I was able to experience the first time in my life where I didn't have a stable income. You know, you kind of don't think about it until you have the time where it, you're like, wow, I went through all the way till the age of 30, where I actually would say that um, I didn't have the ability to say, you know, have control over, over my finances. And going through that, I, you know, I kind of just had a, an emotional breakdown. Just having that moment of where that you, you spend that time with God on your knees and literally just asking him why. You know, you, you know, like I said, I, I grew up in a Christian household. I, I upheld all the Christian values, but yet I still went through a moment of turmoil. The Holy Spirit kind of put it on my heart. Just read. 
I always read, you know, I've, I've always read, but I wasn't reading at the consistency that God calls us to, right? And um, I began to first start off by just reading a chapter. You know, uh, thanks to the Bible apps out there, they, they remind you on a repetitive basis that, hey, you didn't read today. So um, instead of reading just a quote, I read the chapter. And then I began to grow in hunger for the word and um, actually began to to journal about the chapter, how I felt about it. And then I began to put it in the act of, I would say like pretty much acting it out throughout the day the best that I could, you know? So you get cut off while you're driving, you know, you, you pray for them instead of, you know, say other things for them. So uh, understanding that kind of really changed my life and really changed the way I have my standards. I'm truly grateful and truly humbled by it. And uh, you know, it, it really has changed how I look at Christ and how I want to be an example of, of, of love like Christ calls us to be. Well, thank you so much, Jamel and Mabel, for sharing your stories. It is always so awesome to hear uh, just testimonies about what is God is continuing to do today in the 21st century and specifically in your lives in this community here. So, you know, I set this up with like the question, what is the way? And I think the big idea for us this morning is that this is the way, right? Encountering Jesus and getting swept up in his rescue mission, right? That's what this journey of following Jesus is all about. And you know, for the rest of our time this morning, we're going to unpack, you know, parts of um, Saul's story in Acts chapter 9. And I want to highlight a few of these areas, right? The encounter, um, Jesus in community, and then the Jesus mission, right? And as I highlight a few of these things, I want to be careful. And so sidebar, I want to make sure that I'm not saying, you know, following Jesus is just like step-by-step -step journey that's always the same and it looks like ABC, right? That journey is going to be different for everybody. But what I do want to point out is that it is a journey, right? And there are some kind of patterns or big pieces of it that I think sometimes it's helpful for us to recognize where we might be in that journey, how we can come alongside and help each other in that journey, and just what it looks like as we follow Jesus together. So let's dive in, right? Verses three through eight. So remember, we have picked up uh, where Saul was still uh, breathing out murderous threats, and he's asking for permission to go basically chase down the followers of the way. And as he's on, his, on the way to Damascus, on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Okay, so that was verses three through nine there. And I think that's the first kind of step in the way is just encountering Jesus. Right now, Saul here has a pretty dramatic encounter. I think all of us in our different stories, if you get a chance to talk with people, will have different types of encounters. Sometimes it might be dramatic. Sometimes it might be super subtle, right? But in some way, shape or form, they're starting to encounter Jesus. And what I want to highlight here, though, is that this isn't like an instantaneous Saul encounters Jesus and then bam, right? Like he's got it all figured out. Rather, Saul encounters Jesus and he's broken and humbled. Right? Like, can you imagine? He's like the Darth Vader character, right? And now all of a sudden he's blind. He needs help from his people, like the people that were with him to lead him around and take him around, right? He's a broken person at this point. And, and that's where it started for him. Um, but that was the beginning of his journey. The next piece here that I want us to see is um, verses 10 through 19 and then 26 to 27. We won't read all of it, but essentially in verses 10 through 19, this is huge, right? Because the Lord then calls Ananias, right, one of his followers, to go to Saul and essentially heal him, invite him into the Jesus community. Now that's a big ask, right? Keep in mind, Saul was the guy chasing everyone down and throwing them in prison. And Ananias is like, God, are you sure you want me to go talk to this guy? Like, you know who he is, right? And God's like, yes, go, right, go and talk to him. And so Ananias takes a step of faith to go and talk to Saul and heal him, right? And to bring him into this community. And then Saul is transformed. He's baptized at that point there. And so what I want us to see there in that second piece of this journey is the Jesus community, right? There's the Jesus encounter, and then there's the Jesus community, right? That Saul didn't come to know Jesus 
just by himself, right? But there was a community that came around him, a community that took steps of faith to reach out to somebody who was otherwise really, really scary, right? And you see this again happening in verse 26 and 27, because even as Saul was then meeting with the disciples and starting to go and, and share the good news of Jesus, when he got to Jerusalem, the, the disciples in Jerusalem were like, this guy is scary. I don't think we want him to be part of our community. And Barnabas had to go and vouch for him and say, hey guys, like, like he is a brother, right? Um, Welcome him in. And so again, you just see the community at work here. And then lastly, throughout, right, um, you can imagine there could have been a lot of animosity and hatred towards Saul. Again, he had thrown a lot of these people, maybe their family members, into prison, right? And yet the church responded with grace in inviting him in, even as people were... Um, as enemies of uh, Christianity were then, of the way, were then looking to persecute and kill Saul, um, it was the early church who gathered around him and helped him escape, right? And so they welcomed him in to the community of Jesus, and, and that was a huge next step there. The last piece, right, so we said the Jesus encounter, the Jesus community, is the Jesus mission, right? And I think this is a huge piece of it, is that when we encounter Jesus, we are not only personally transformed, but then we are also swept up in Jesus's mission um, to rescue people, right? And to make all things new and to restore the world. Um, you see this so clearly in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, right? Uh, God says to Ananias, talking about Saul, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Right? And then Acts 9.31 ends with, Then the church throughout Judea, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Right? And I think what we see there is Saul's conversion, right? His dramatic transformation, his entering into following Jesus and entering into Jesus' community was ultimately about continuing Jesus' mission, right? His mission to help people discover his good news, to help people discover eternal life and forgiveness in him. Um, and, you know, note here, right? Sometimes we think coming to know Jesus is going to be rainbows and ponies and butterflies, right? It is definitely not. And God makes it so clear here, right? I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer, right? And yet, if you look in Paul's letters in Philippians 3, he says it's all worth it, right? It was all worth it um, because he knows Jesus and he's being caught up in this amazing mission and story of what Jesus is doing to not only restore Paul, but to restore all things. So with that said, right, again, it's the way, it's a journey. And I think when you look at Paul's story, even throughout his life, he is continuing to grow and to develop and to wrestle with what it means to follow Jesus. But you definitely begin to see what God is doing in him and through him. And I think it's a beautiful picture. Um, having kind of humanized Saul a little bit, I do also want to point out that, you know, Saul was uniquely equipped for the purpose that God called him to. Right? Saul was a Hebrew by nationality, right? trained as a Pharisee, but he was also a Roman citizen. Right? And for that reason, he sat at the intersection of two worlds and he was the perfect bridge builder to help bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to help bring the gospel to the good news of Jesus to people who hadn't yet heard it. And so I think as we come in for a landing uh, this morning, there's just kind of two questions for us. Right? One is, where are you on this journey? Right? As we talk about the way, right? where are you in that journey? Share your story with someone. Share where you are in that journey so that you guys can kind of journey together in community. And the second piece is to think about how has your story shaped you to be a bridge builder for others? Right? How are you being caught up in Jesus' mission so that what God has done in your life can then be um, something he's going to use um, to be good news to the people around you? So with that this morning, um, we've talked so much about, you know, the amazing transformative work that Jesus does. We've seen it in the life of Jamel, of Mabel, of Saul here. And we've seen just that the way is about encountering Jesus and getting caught up in his love and his rescue mission to restore the world. And it ultimately comes down to Jesus, right? And so as we enter into a time of communion, a time where we you know, eat the elements, the bread and the wine, it's all about remembering what Jesus has done, remembering his love, remembering his sacrifice, remembering his resurrection, and the fact that he is beginning to make all things new and we get to be a part of that and enjoy the life that he gives so take some time prepare the elements at home and then when you're ready take and eat sing aloud god is with us we 
was surrounded by his goodness. Sing it louder if you found grace as you walk into a new day in the valley of the victory. No, he's never gonna leave me. Sing it louder through the failure. Aren't you glad we got a
All right, thank you everyone for being with us this morning. Again, we are just so excited um, to be able to worship together and excited for this mission that God is calling us on and what he's doing in us and through us. And I just want to close with this one um, passage from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. This is Paul talking toward the ends of his life, but he's looking back at that conversion moment um, that we saw today in Acts chapter 9. And he says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.